Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on uh, calcium signalling. In this video, what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, how uh, the metabotropic glutamate receptor, and we're specifically going to look at the metabotropic glutamate receptor uh, 5, mglu R5, meaning metabotropic glutamate receptor 5. We're going to look at how this receptor can build up calcium oscillations, basically. So uh, oscillations in the level of calcium in the cytoplasm of cells uh, with this receptor on. Okay, right. Uh, so uh, this is quite a nice um, mechanism, basically, because unlike all other mechanisms that you will see, this is going to be, this is going to, firstly, it's going to use the IP3 pathway and it's actually going to create oscillations in the level of IP3 and that then is going to cause the oscillations in calcium. So, let's have a look at this pathway then. Right, so the mGluR5 uh, is a uh, G protein coupled receptor or a seven transmembrane receptor. So it has seven membrane spanning alpha helices like so, there's five, six, Seven. So this is the metabotropic glutamate receptor. So I'll write its name out nice and big. Metabotropic glutamate receptor. So its endogenous ligand in the body is glutamate. Metabotropic glutamate receptor. Right. And the G protein which it's coupled to is the GQ G protein. So let's draw this. So this is a heterotrimeric G protein. Uh, and uh, because it's a GQG protein, that means that the alpha subunit is set, basically. It's an alpha Q in the alpha position for this heterotrimeric G protein. The beta and the gamma subunit uh, aren't, we don't know what they are, uh, it doesn't matter, basically. The beta subunits, there are five different beta subunits uh, that are coded for by the human genome, and there are 12 different gamma subunits. So there are many different uh, combinations that you could choose for what beta and gamma subunit you like. The important thing about this heterotrimeric G protein is that the alpha subunit is a specific sort, and it's the alpha Q uh, subunit, basically. Right, so this now is the heterotrimeric G protein that we would call GQ. And you'll note that GQ is not one specific heterotrimeric G protein. There are many different beta and gamma subunits you could use here, and this would still be a GQ G protein. So GQ basically just refers to the fact that the alpha subunit is set, but not the beta and the gamma, basically. It doesn't say anything about those. Right, so... Uh, the metabotropic glutamate receptor, specifically the metabotropic glutamate receptor 5, uh, is coupled to GQ. And uh, basically, when the metabotropic glutamate receptor is inactive, and also the heterotrimeric G protein is inactive, which means that the alpha subunit uh, is bonded to GDP, uh, so, uh, when they're both inactive, in some situations, the uh, G protein can be physically coupled to um, the actual, um, um, well, the, sorry, the, um, the G protein coupled receptor can be physically bonded to the inactive G protein. Uh, in other cases, what, the, what will happen is that the heterotrimeric G protein will be bound to the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer. So uh, this is the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer, this inner layer of phospholipids here. Okay, so it will be racing around uh, on the inner leaflet of the phospholipid by there. And uh, when the um, receptor, the metabotropic glutamate receptor 5, becomes activated by glutamate binding to it, so let's say here is the glutamate coming to bind to the extracellular uh, domain of this metabotropic glutamate receptor 5, then uh, the metabotropic glutamate receptor 5 will become catalytically active, basically. And when it does, it will chop off this GDP molecule and add on a GTP molecule onto that alpha Q subunit. So, you now have your GTP um, bound to this alpha Q subunit here, okay? So you've got alpha Q, GTP, and now once the alpha Q subunit has GTP bound to it, it no longer wants to associate with the beta and the gamma subunits. So they remain bound to each other. They keep each other, but they no longer uh, are bound to this alpha subunit. So here's the beta gamma subunit. Okay, right. Now, what does alpha Q GTP do next? 
Well, basically, it activates an enzyme that is in the uh, phospholipid bilayer of the cell. So let's say here is another um, drawing with the phospholipid bilayer there. And here is this enzyme that it's going to activate. And basically, the name of this enzyme is phospholipase C. And it's specifically phospholipase C of the beta type. So the alpha Q GTP molecule is going to go and bind and activate the phospholipase C beta. So this is phospholipase C beta. OK, right. So once you've had phospholipase C beta activated, then uh, phospholipase C beta conducts its enzymatic reaction. And its enzymatic reaction involves degrading a, uh, a um, molecule that you find in the cell membrane, namely PIP2, which stands for phosphatidyl inositol uh, 4,5-bisphosphate. So here's a little cartoon drawing of inositol, of um, phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate. Uh, so this is PIP2 here. Okay, right, and that stands for phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate. Phosphatidyl, and phosphatidyl basically means phospholipid, so it refers to this group here, basically, uh, with the two hydrophobic tails, uh, which are the two carboxylic acids, is stirified to this glycerol molecule here, and then with this phosphate group there, so that's a phospholipid, so that's what we mean by phosphatidyl. Then you have inositol which is this six-membered carbon ring here. And then the 4,5-bisphosphate refers to these two phosphate groups that are bound off the inositol, 4,5-bisphosphate. OK, so that's PIP2. Right, OK, so um, basically, phospholipase C beta takes this molecule, which is found in the cell layer, uh, cell, uh, phospholipid cell bi uh, pho the phospholipid bilayer, the cell membrane, and it cleaves this bond here. So I'll show that in a different colour. So it's going to cleave this connection between the phosphate group here, which I'll draw in pink. So this is a phosphate group here, and the glycerol molecule, which I'll show in green. So here is the glycerol molecule, which is bound over here to these two fatty acids and bound here to this phosphate group. So it basically cleaves that bond, and what you end up with is a diacylglyceride, which is these two long-chain carboxylic acids, with a glycerol molecule there holding them together. And you also end up with inositol 1,4,5-trisphosphate, which is inositol bonded to phosphate groups uh, three times, like so. OK, so this is inositol 1,4,5-trisphosphate. Uh, 1,4,5-trisphosphate. OK, and uh, the other molecule was a diacylglyceride. So this is diacylglyceride. Now, this IP3 molecule, we have studied in detail what that does. We know exactly what this does. This goes to the endoplasmic reticulum, which I'll draw here. So let's say this is the endoplasmic reticulum phospholipid by there. So this is the ER lumen inside, and then the cytoplasm out here. Right, and basically, in the membrane of the ER, you have what are known as IP3 receptors. So this is a massive, great IP3 receptor. Okay, and IP3 receptors are made up of four different subunits, like so. Um, so uh, there are four different subunits that comprise the whole IP3 receptor. Uh, and there are three different genes which code for proteins which you can use as these four um, quarters of the IP3 receptor, basically. And you can either make homotetramers where you use the same, exact same protein encoded by the exact same gene in all four sockets, or you can make heterotetramers where you mix and match, basically, and don't use oh, just one gene to make a single protein, which you then use four times uh, in each of these sockets. Okay, but the important thing is that before IP3 binds, so this is inositol 1,4,5-trisphosphate, which is often abbreviated to IP3, um, before in the IP3 binds, there is a calcium, uh, there's an inhibitory calcium binding site available on this IP3 receptor, where if calcium binds 
uh, to those um, inhibitory calcium binding sites. And I should just make this a little bit more clear. Uh, there's an inhibitory calcium binding site on each one of the four um, subunits that makes up the IP3 receptor. And if calcium comes and binds in these calcium binding sockets, uh, then it's going to cause an inactivation of the receptor. It's going to make it even less likely that it will go into the open state, okay? Now, when IP3 binds to the IP3 receptor, there are four different IP3 binding sites on the uh, receptor, one for each of the four subunits. So I'll denote these IP3 binding sites in pink. So, uh, four IP3 molecules need to come, and one needs to bind to each of the IP3 binding sites on each of the four receptors. So, overall, four molecules need to bind. Okay? So, when IP3 binds to this IP3 binding site, what happens is this inhibitory calcium binding site is removed, and what, what is exposed instead is an stimulatory calcium binding site. So basically, when IP3 binds, uh, the receptor changes conformation so that this inhibitory calcium binding site gets lost, basically. It goes and is no longer visible. And now, instead, what you have available is uh, four stimulatory calcium binding sites, which we'll draw here. So you've got these stimulatory calcium binding sites instead. And now if calcium comes and binds to these stimulatory calcium binding sites, that will trigger the opening of this receptor. So IP3 primes the receptor so that it's ready to open, basically, if calcium comes and binds to these stimulatory uh, calcium binding sites. And when that happens, um, and what will happen is the receptor opens and basically there's a lot of calcium in the intracellular stores in the ER lumen and there's very little calcium in the extracellular, well in the cytosol uh, around 100 nanomolar concentration so calcium is going to leave through this IP3 receptor which is now open and you're going to get calcium going up in the cytoplasm okay so that's that arm at the moment, we haven't seen how this is going to lead to oscillations in calcium. And what's going to basically happen is that we're going to get oscillatory levels of IP3, and therefore we're going to get oscillatory levels of primed IP3 receptors, and therefore oscillate between this IP3 receptor being open and closed, and that will lead to the calcium oscillations. But we'll see that in the next video.